Hello, BookTube. Sorry for the change of location yet again. I move all around. I'm quick that way. Uh, but I wanted to make a video, even though it's very late at night, uh, on uh, ShakeTube 2017. Uh, for those of you who might not be following along <laughs> with the program notes, uh, that is a 15-week read-along that's organized by Lukash at Lukash's Books and Curtis at Curtis Books and Films uh, of Shakespeare. 15 Shakespeare plays. We read one a week. And at the end of the week, uh, Friday or Saturday or Sunday, we uh, make a video saying what we thought of it. Uh, and it's going on. We're in the final stretch now. It's going on until early December. Uh, and this week, this week we assail the mountain. <laughs> this week we do King Lear, uh, which is uh, Shakespeare's most unknowable play, most powerful play. Uh, in my opinion, one of his most brilliant plays. I think. I think it's only. It only has a couple of rivals, and even those don't have its power. It, what Shakespeare did. I mean, he was a Shakespeare, as we've seen, right in Shakespeare in Shake Tube so far. Shakespeare is a master reworker of old material. Uh, we've only in Shake Tube. We've hardly ever touched on a play that was original to Shakespeare. Most of the time, he takes other he takes older material and reworks it. And in this case, in this case, he reworks an old story into something towering, just towering, and strange, and violent, and exhausting to read or especially to watch. And yet, it cleans you out completely. It is King Lear is, in my opinion the greatest example of the Aristotelian idea of catharsis, where you go through something horrible and in the end you feel purged and lighter, uh, which is, you know, at the heart of the peculiar magic that is the theater. Uh, but it, Lear is the story, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen other Shade 2 videos since mine's going up later, uncharacteristically late for me. Uh, it's the story of an, an old king who decides to to divide his kingdom between his daughters, his three daughters, Reagan, Goneril, and Cordelia, uh, and retire, become sort of an itinerant pleasure seeker. He doesn't say it that way. He says that he's just going to retire and wait to die, but he, he has a retinue of a hundred knights that he keeps to himself and is intent on just keeping moving around his kingdom uh, and having himself and his knights housed at the expense of his daughters who, and whoever's part of the kingdom he happens to be in. Uh, so it's a pretty active retirement that he's that he's setting up for himself. He's getting rid of the the boring, tedious parts of being king and keeping all the rest. He's even keeping the title. Um, and at the beginning of the play, the the incredible, incredible opening scene, he requires that his daughters profess their love for him, uh, alleging that uh, the richness of the third of his kingdom that each one of them gets will depend on how well a job they do. <laughs> and so Regan and Goneril lay it on with a trowel, uh, professing their love to the skies. Cordelia refuses to do that. She refuses to do it at all. She says that uh, she loves her father exactly as much as is her duty as his daughter, but that she hopes that when she marries, the man she marries will have half her heart. So she can't actually say that her father means everything to her the way her sisters have so immediately said with her husbands right there. Uh, and in that scene, if we have to find a pressure point in King Lear, in, that's the scene that starts the avalanche. That that moment seems to break something in Lear. He, he before then, is, a, is a, a serious old man making a dreadful mistake. <laughs> but only that. Uh, that moment seems to rob him of some element of some of self-command. Uh, one of his daughters mentions a little later on that he's only he's only, he, that he's only ever seldom known, slimly known himself. He, he's, in other words, he's always been passionate and flown to fly off at a handle. And when he banishes his most faithful retainer, that retainer says, see better, uh, because it, it's obvious that there's something wrong, <laughs> that something, that something has, has derailed his thinking. Uh, Cordelia's refusal to heave up her heart into her mouth breaks Lear's reason, and it just gets worse from there. And what follows is an amazing performance, an amazing role for an actor. And 
almost impossible to do. Lear goes down the levels of, of comparative self-control until finally he's a howling animal on the heath in the wind and the storm. <laughs> in rags. Lost to himself. Lost to reason. Lost to the world. Lost to his kingdom. Uh, and only comes to himself at the very end when it's too late. Uh, and the sheer size and breadth and howling loudness of the role creates a problem. <laughs> it, it creates a problem that we see in a lot of Shakespeare roles, which is that it's uncastable. Uh, we, for instance, in Romeo and Juliet, the, the main two characters are teenagers. And in Shakespeare's day, as in ours, it's almost impossible to find teenagers who can do what is required of them dramatically by those two roles. So they never go to teenagers. I've seen Romeo played by a man in his late 50s. Uh, and the same thing is true with Lear. The, <clears throat> he has two, his three grown daughters. It stands to reason that he himself is in his 50s or 60s or older. Uh, and yet a man, an actor in his 50s or 60s, is almost certainly not going to be able to do convincingly the kind of mad show that we get from Lear, that, that, the, that the play calls for. Uh, it's, so it's, it, it sets up a dichotomy that is, you have to find your way around because if you have a, you know, a legendary theatrical icon who comes to King Lear when he's all gray in his hair, he's not going to be able to do it. He's not going to be able to rant and rage in the way that would make Lear most effective. But a young man can't do it because it wouldn't be believable. Uh, and that causes a problem with staging. Inevitably, when people talk about King Lear, they talk about King Lear on the stage because it seems to be a problem that Shakespeare is setting up himself, intentionally. Uh, I think, myself, that it shows a clear furtherance of a pattern of impatience with the limitations of his art that you can trace through Shakespeare's plays. I think you can see it clear as day how he grows less and less patient with the limitations of what he's doing. In fact, in my opinion, he starts to write movies and just doesn't know it. Of course, no one knows it. I, I firmly believe, what is the Tempest? <laughs> but uh, it, it, Lear causes problems with, with staging because not only do you have a, uh, the lead character who you can't cast, but you have a, a howling storm on the heath in the middle of the play. And all of these gigantic emotions that are that are roiling around, not only in Lear's family, but in the, there's a shadowy second family, a second family drama playing out right alongside it. It's all so epic that it can lead to a feeling of disappointment when you go to see it on the stage. Uh, that's not always been true. It, it, uh, uh, some people are pleased by it, uh, uh, if they're lucky enough to get a performance of it. But it was definitely true, it's definitely true in the case of, of another slightly cracked old man who's involved in Shake 2, 2017. And that's not me, <laughs> that's Harold Bloom, <laughs> whose uh, who's play, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human. Uh, uh, Curtis and Lukash thought originally that it might be good to sort of use this as a guiding text. As, as we went along. I've noticed that that idea has sort of fallen by the wayside. As people have studied Bloom's chapters on the various plays that we're talking about, they've, it's been my impression, and perhaps I've helped in that impression, they've come away a little bit unsatisfied with some of his, with some of his dictums and some of his observations. Uh, or maybe it's just that Shake Tube 2017 is realizing that there's only room for one crazy old man in the equation. I don't know, one way or another. But in, in his chapter on King Lear, he hits on the, the uh, problems of production right away. Uh, the first line uh, of his chapter on King Lear is actually something that I don't disagree with. He says that King Lear, together with Hamlet, ultimately baffles commentary. Yet he proceeds to comment on it, and so does everybody else. So, uh, but it, it's it's the next paragraph that's the key here. Uh, the experience of reading King Lear, in particular, is altogether uncanny. We are at once estranged and uncomfortably at home. For me, at least, no other solitary experience is at all like it. I emphasize reading more than ever because I have attended many stagings of King Lear and invariably regretted being there. 
Uh, our directors and actors are defeated by this play, and I began sadly to agree with Charles Lamb that we, might, that we ought to keep rereading King Lear and avoid its staged travesties. That pits me against the scholarly criticism of our century and against all the theater people that I know, but in this matter, opposition is true friendship. In the, in the pure good of theory, the part of Lear should be playable. If we cannot accomplish it, the flaw is in us. And in the authentic decline of our cognitive and literary culture, assaulted by films, television, and computers, our inner and outer ears have difficulty apprehending Shakespeare's hum of thoughts, etc., etc. Uh, you could be sure that in those performances of King Lear that he went to and that he was regretted being there, you can be sure that he made everyone around him regret being there too. Uh, but I see his point. Uh, and in, like I said, invariably this comes around to performances. If you're lucky enough to have seen Lear on the stage, uh, I, this is one of the things I always watch for in ShakeTube videos. I listen carefully to see which of my fellow ShakeTubers uh, has seen the play in question, or any play in question. Uh, I, I think that on this heading, I might I might uh, have a little advantage over, over the rest of you. I've seen every Shakespeare play, and I've seen many of them many times. I've seen many Lears, <laughs> many, many Lears, and many different versions, many different ways to go about it. I've seen the uh, <clears throat> the famous Heath scene done by an uh, actor in his 60s howling and running all over stage completely naked with actual rot water pouring on him. They, they simulated a rainstorm on stage every night and twice on Sunday. <laughs> uh, and I've also seen the, the mad scene in fact, the whole of the play done uh, in business world attire with with the actor playing Lear intentionally almost never raising his voice, not playing mad at all, not howling, not screaming, not anything like that. And believe it or not, it actually underscored the madness of some of those scenes. Uh, and I've also seen it done, you know, the conventional way. The conventional way nowadays is uh, sort of vague bathrobe type wardrobe and a minimal stage uh, to sort of concentrate on uh, the directors will say they're concentrating on the power of the words really it's that we don't really know much about uh, how we should we should stage this or how we should clothe it uh, Laurence Olivier famously uh, his version was his best pastiche at uh, you know uh, ancient Britain with Stonehenge in the background and people wearing replicas of stuff that's been dug out of fields <laughs> in, in Gloucester and wherever. Uh, and others have been futuristic. The uh, the urging here is the same one that I always have when I do Shakespeare or ShakeTube, which is don't miss an opportunity to see any Shakespeare play that's done anywhere near you. Lear is a particularly big Shakespeare play and particularly frightening for a, performance, for a performing troupe to do. It's unlikely that it will be the Shakespeare play stage near you. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's unlikely. It's a big deal. Not only because it's so violent, I mean, a, a, someone's blinded on stage, uh, but also because of the central role. It's really hard in, in, if you have a, you know, your local Ottumwa, Iowa theater group is is going to have, you know, Joe Klein, who's the, the chief mechanic in town, but who's getting on in years and tends to play the old man. He would be the, the old lord in a P.G. Woodhouse stage production or something or other. To go to him in his split-level ranch and say, well, we're going to do Lear next year, <laughs> and so you've got to howl and scream and then take most of your clothes off and lose your mind on stage in front of an, in front of an audience of your 4-H club and the, the children of your, of your fellow PTA members is asking a lot. Uh, so local theater groups tend to shy away from Lear. Uh, it's a big, it's a, it's a big challenge. So, uh, you know, I consider myself very lucky that I've seen it. I've seen it in many countries. I've seen it in many languages. Uh, and I have to admit, in a way, Harold Bloom and by extension, Charles Lamb, my beloved Charles Lamb are correct. You're only ever going to get a fraction on the stage of what you get in the privacy of your own head when you're reading it. it Lear is a, is a, <laughs> I would argue that that fractionalizing happens in almost every Shakespeare play. Uh, and the fact that it happens with Lear is, you know, not, not, it's not endemic to Lear, and it's not a reason not to see it live. 
Uh, I think only the snobbiest, purest, no names, mind you, <laughs> uh, would look at a live performance and concentrate on what's not there. Because uh, with Lear, you're going to be missing something. Uh, but uh, I was it was a, an enormous pleasure to reread it for ShakeTube, especially knowing, as I've said a few times in these videos, knowing while I was reading it that some people would be reading it for the first time, or the second time, but only the first time as you know, a card-carrying, due-paying adult with with a fair amount of complexity under your belt, it it dismays and astonishes me that this play is required reading anywhere. Lear is one of a handful of works that I would say must never be made compulsory to read. If you're not ready to read this, reading it at the wrong time can be as harmful as not reading it at all. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, that that's... King Lear. <laughs> That's, this is I, I have mentioned before that uh, that I have taught Shakespeare and I have in, I have introduced Shakespeare to a large number of people, and I've mentioned that my method of doing that is to divvy up parts and simply speak our way through the play. I never do that with King Lear. <laughs> it's 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 too volatile. It's dynamite. Uh, so I I don't do it with that. Uh, but it was a joy to reread it, and it's going to be a joy, it's been a joy so far, to watch all of these videos and find out what people who maybe don't have... This play and I go back a long way. <laughs> uh, maybe to watch videos by people who maybe don't have that is is wonderful, as, the, you know, is this the strength of ShakeTube? And I, I'm i not 100% sure, but I think uh, next time we're doing Macbeth. Uh, so we'll have we'll, well. This is a block of tragedy that we're doing, as if the people who were struggling through NaNoWriMo needed that. Uh, but uh, I will, well, I, one way or another, I will double check, and we will be back. We will meet again <laughs> next weekend uh, for that. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you, BookTube.